monthly that went out and there was a statement that read, plant a tree and it begins to grow, but set a post and it begins to decay. Which are you, a tree planted and growing or a post simply decaying? Interesting quote if you think about it because the quote was related to spiritual growth. Usually growth in the church today, we unfortunately and unbiblically apply it always to numbers because that's typically all we think. Uh, the interesting thing is that scripture speaks of growth in a spiritual sense. That individual believers, when you and I believe in Christ alone, when we place our faith in Christ, we of course experience the new birth. What the tragedy so often is, is that that should not be the end. I actually have always made the case that's only the beginning. That's the beginning of a life that is being shaped and formed by Christ and the Word of God. And so like a tree, we are supposed to grow spiritually over the course of our lives and bear fruit for God's glory. Otherwise, we are in, to use that statement, nothing more than a post dug into the ground and decaying. Tonight we will see one of the, what I believe is more practical passages, in particular in 2 Peter, that deals with the fruitful Christian life and how we are to grow spiritually. Uh, it is a great passage, it's very practical, and it will help us a lot in our faith because, as I said before, the, the illustration, the statement is so appropriate. You and I, when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we are to be like a plant, or in other words, like a tree. And what does it do? It naturally begins to grow and it blossoms. But all too often we become like a post, a fence post, and simply headed towards decay. So if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn to 2 Peter. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verses 5 through 9. And uh, we'll start with an outline tonight, but again, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. And the outline is very simple. Verses 5 through 7, we'll look at the seven virtues. Faith alone is the foundation. And then Peter gives us seven virtues, all seven we are supposed to have, and all seven we are supposed to grow in over the course of our lives. Verses 8 through 9 point to the need to grow. It's a very simple passage, um, yet profound in its many, many ways of applying it. Let's begin by reading. We'll have the text on the screen if you didn't uh, bring your Bibles, but we'll read again. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. So we pick up where we left off. Verse 5. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge... And in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless or unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. If you recall, of course, this is the third message we've done. Uh, we mostly had the first message was primarily background information to help us better understand it. And the greeting of Second Peter. We know that Peter, of course, wrote this to a group of individuals in what we would call today Turkey. It's modern-day Turkey, but it would be Asia Minor, different from the seven churches area. This is north-central Turkey uh, today, we would call it. And he wrote it somewhere between 1 Peter and his martyrdom in 67 AD. I, I take it in the latter. I think it was closer to his martyrdom. We'll see this next week. Uh, but you notice if we looked at before, he knew his death was imminent. It was at any moment. But the purpose of it, and this was the purpose that I've had for the letter itself of Second Peter, if the believer grows in the knowledge of Christ and in their faith, so knowledge of Christ and in their faith, they will be protected from false teaching as they await Christ's return 
and the new heavens and new earth. So in a sense, if you imagine, you place your faith in Jesus Christ, and we grow in that faith, and as we grow in that faith, we are protected naturally from false teaching because then you can say, wait a minute, that doesn't line up with what the Word of God teaches, for example. Now, we saw last time that in verses 3 through 4, Peter says that we have been given everything. I'll draw your attention to that one more time. He says, seeing that his divine power has granted, that means to give in the past with ongoing benefits, everything. So not 75%, not 85%, not 99.9%. He's given us everything. So verse 3 says that his divine power has given us everything to live a godly life. And one of the means by which we, in a sense, apply that is verse 4, which is divine promises. Divine three, or excuse me, verse 3 is divine power. Verse 4 is divine promises, his word. So I liken it to a newborn child. Generally speaking, of course, we know that a child, when it's born, it has everything that it needs. It just needs to what? It needs to grow and flourish and so forth. If you had, as I said last time, a 19-year-old who was still in diapers, and I'm not trying to make fun of that, but, but if you had something, you would know that there was some sort of issue with the development. And in like manner, Christians can be much like that. We can have experience of the new birth and being no different than a newborn child decades later. And so Peter says that we need to simply grow and mature in our faith. Now, as we look at verses 5 through 7, I call these the seven virtues, and that's essentially what they are. It's interesting because what Peter is showing here, because I think probably in the back of his mind, and I can't guarantee this, but I would suspect what probably is in the back of his mind is this. I wonder if they'll think I can just simply sit and sour as a Christian. I can place my faith in Jesus Christ, and I can, like the post, simply sit and do nothing. Right? I I suspect that's probably in Peter's mind, especially being a pastor, if you will, would be the concern of that. So what he's going to say here is he's going to show us very simply this. The new birth, as I often argue, is just the beginning. It is not the end. I know that's what we typically see. If we can just get them to pray that sinner's prayer, they're good to go. And that is so far from what the Word of God teaches. And we wonder why we have so many posts instead of trees. Now, you'll notice how he starts this. He says, now for this very reason, so for what Stephen has in a sense, what I've just written, what I've just tried to explain, for this very reason, apply all diligence. It simply would read more literally, you need to supply in a sense what God doesn't. In other words, you have a part to play. You need to make every effort would be another way to render this. This gentleman in his commentary puts it this way. Now, I'm not an expert in cars. I know how to turn them on. I know how to put the gas in them, and I can change. Well, anyway. (laughs) But what he uses here is a really helpful illustration. The Christian life is like the use of power steering on a car. The engine provides the power for the steering, but the driver must actually turn the wheel. That actually is a pretty accurate way in terms of spiritual. And I don't know how accurate it is in terms of a car, but it works for this because that is very true. God has given you everything. He's given you all the power and he's given you the word of God. All you have to do is do your part, do your due diligence and apply and supply your part to it. In other words, if you had a car and it had power steering, well, great. It'll still run off the road if you're not careful. Want you to turn it. You have your piece and your part to play. But it bears repeating something, and I wasn't originally planning to do this, but I want you to notice it says, for this very reason, you need to supply, you need to do your part, in other words. In your faith, we need to be very careful with this, and I'm going to digress for a second. The virtues are built on the foundation of faith. None of these things earn salvation. This is what comes afterwards. In other words, how does one have eternal life? 
Let's just look in the text that we have before our eyes. Look up in verse 1. It's really the second sentence, but it's 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. But notice this. Who is he writing to? To those who have received a faith of the same kind as mine. In other words, as an apostle. How does faith come? By the righteousness of, God, of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So faith is belief in the way Peter's articulating it, in the righteousness of God and our Savior. So the foundation for which these virtues build off of is faith. Faith is the foundation. Nothing else matters until this peace is there. This is key for two things. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can't earn your salvation. None of these other things are part of salvation. But this is also where it begins. It begins with faith. And then from faith, we have the empowerment of God to do so many different things. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, none of this will happen. This is why whenever you try to earn salvation, you try to make yourself right with God. It never works. It always begins with the righteousness of God through Christ. And then you have the imputed righteousness, the Holy Spirit, and you begin to grow in your faith. Now, the virtues, you've probably seen some images of the virtues. And typically the images of the virtues are either a pyramid form, which is helpful, or the steps. I'm not a big fan of the steps because the steps make it seem like, well, I'll start with faith and then I do the blah, blah. I'm always a little leery of that. On the screen, um, I want you to see this. Now, I did not draw this. This, to me, is actually the best one that I've ever seen. If you don't like it, that's fine. When you teach on this, you can use your own picture. But I think this one is, and the reason why I say it is because it's so biblically accurate. Uh, the pyramid has its failings. This one's pretty good. I really don't know of any real issue with it. You'll notice faith, but you'll also notice before that what's in the hand is some sort of masonry, of course, is some sort of bricks. So the foundation is solid, but the foundation is faith. And you notice faith is where everything rests on. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, there is no imputed righteousness. Without faith, there's no Holy Spirit. Without faith, none of these things are possible. I think that one is the best one because then you have this block, almost like a mason's block. And on top of that, you'll notice, but they're all equal. In other words, you don't gravitate and say, well, you know, I placed my faith one time and I had brotherly love back when I was a child. I haven't done it since then, but no, there, there's no picking and choosing. It's like the fruit of the Spirit. We don't pick and choose which ones we're going to do. Peter expects all of them and all of them to be present and all of them to grow. Notice the order. And, the, and, of course, I think they're taking this from the, I'm not sure if it's the New King James, but in any case, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, bro-kindness, that's brotherly kindness, and agape, love. And so I think that one is the most helpful one that I've seen. There's nothing wrong with the stair steps. I just think it's a little bit disproportioned. Uh, the pyramid is a little bit misleading in errors, but I think this one is probably the best one, but... I hope it will help you. In verses 5 through 7, though, he's going to have these seven virtues. If we don't have faith in Jesus Christ, none of these make any difference. Because that is the foundation by faith alone and Christ alone, redemption. So we begin with the first one. The first one is moral excellence or the word we get for virtue. So we're going to go through these. Again, these are in verses 5 through 7. The first one is moral excellence or virtue. So this is virtue in action, you could say. These are deeds of excellence. These are things that are part of our daily lives. We should have a moral excellence as part of our Christian character, the Christian virtue or character. Now, these, this list isn't the only list in Scripture, okay? But this is Peter's 
uh, listing here. So he begins with moral excellence. So this will be daily living, having a life of morality. When's the last time we've heard in church that the church needs to have individuals with morality? And that's what we need to hear today, is the morality. And there is virtue in action, moral excellence, deeds of, uh, of excellence, for example. And so the way that he does this is he says, in your faith, you need to supply with it the idea of virtue and action. In other words, you need to have a moral life, deeds of excellence, daily living. And in that, also knowledge. Knowledge is probably one of the most important words in Second Peter. If you recall when we started, this was on the precipice of what's called Gnosticism, Gnostics which doesn't come really out until the 2nd and 3rd century. Gnosticism taught this. You can live any way you want to because the body is evil anyway. The spirit's all that really matters, in a sense. Eat, drink, and be merry. You just do whatever you want. The other thing that it taught was that knowledge was secret, only certain individuals had access to this knowledge, and of course it was apropos and very, appro uh, very helpful for them, because think about it, what was it for them? They had the knowledge. That's convenient, isn't it? And you had to go to them. Peter goes for three chapters and says, no, all knowledge is prepared. Where is it? It's right here. There is nowhere else to find knowledge. You can go from the ends of creation to one side to the next, this is the only source of true knowledge, and it's not secret. You might run from it, but it's not secret. And so he uses this word here, knowledge. And so you have moral excellence and knowledge. This is what you would think of as acquired knowledge. This would be practical wisdom. Last week, if you were with us, and if not, the, the message is on our YouTube page. If you remember last week, we looked at the precious promises, verse 4. He's given us his precious and magnificent promises. The promises are in the Word of God. God's Word shapes, it guides the decisions we make, the way we live our lives. When we have to make a decision on something in the church, where do we go? God help us if we don't turn to God's Word. That is the guide. That is the tool. As a pastor, to be honest with you, I'm not interested in your opinions initially. It's fine to give it to me. Uh, but in the end, God's Word is the guide because my opinion could be wrong. God's Word is never wrong. And so God's Word, though, is meaningless to the Christian if we don't apply it. Don't be simply what? dead post hearers of the word and then go live a life of sin and immorality and forgetting all that you've learned. We, we need to have practical wisdom. And the word of God shapes the Christian. If you do not spend time every day in God's word and then as you learn it, apply it, you're not able to do this. This is practical wisdom, practical knowledge. And from that knowledge, he he moves into verse 6 to self-control. Self-control is a very important one. I'm going to read this definition. It's, it's helpful here. Mastery of self, disciplined moderation. This means to avoid extremes. Controlling one's desires and passions. So again, mastery of self, disciplined moderation. In other words, to avoid the extremes and controlling one's desires and passions. That's a really important one we have as Christians that we need to have. We need to have moral excellence. In other words, in our daily lives, living out the things that we know practically through knowledge and then have self-control. One of the most important ones, I think, is the avoiding extremes because we can do this in the church a lot of times. We can go to one extreme to the next. And, you know, in Solomon says, avoid the extremes. We need to be really careful with this because you can do much damage in a church in our own lives if we constantly run to the extreme. The next one, after moral excellence, knowledge, and self-control is perseverance. We all need perseverance. We would all need endurance. This means to endure the difficulties and hardships in life as we walk with the Lord. In case you've never heard me say this before, 
I know that the popular teaching today is going to be against what I say here right now, which is this. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, it is not all downhill and shady. It is not a bed of roses. God does not promise the bank account to be filled. If you have heard that, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. It is so. But let me tell you this. Can you imagine being taught that and then you face the difficulties of life and you say, I don't understand. This is why so many of those health, wealth, name it and claim it, prosperity gospel preachers, they don't have an answer to this and all they say is you don't have enough faith. Should have given more. No. What we need to learn is that suffering is good for us. Endurance and difficulties in life. If you never encountered any difficulties in life, you will never grow. I want you to turn with me to the book of James. James chapter 1. So take a left on the New Testament highway. You don't have to go very far. I think it's two exits down. If anybody got my humor. And I take it not. So anyway. I'm tired of my jokes for the day. Just a little fun, all right? Let's read, it's, it's really in verse 3, but it's probably better read from verses 2 and 3. Let's just read this. Now this is James here speaking of the testing of faith. Wait a minute. What do you mean? I thought I'd just shake the preacher's hand, get my little membership card, and I'm good to go. Stop by Doug's office and get the tithe offering, and I'm ready to go. But what does it say? I mean, what, what does the Word of God say? It does not matter what I say. What does God's Word say? Consider it all joy. Oh, this will be great. My brethren, when you encounter various trials... Did you just read that right? Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you can encounter various trials. Notice why. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, endurance... This is what you must cultivate. It must be there, but it must grow. And it's this idea of perseverance and endurance. I keep thinking of 2 Timothy when he speaks of the farmer. The farmer, what does he do? He goes out there and he drops the seed and he plows and he goes in night after night, day after day. And what does he do? He waits. He has no control over the results, but it says that endurance and this idea of faithful endurance, we must endure, but when we have difficulties, they shape us. And then when you encounter them next time, you're able to overcome them. And how do you overcome them? By the precious promises of God. And we grow in our faith. We don't sit and sour in our faith. I, I think that is the plague. One of them of Christianity today is we have pew writers who have become post because they have soured rather than bore fruit. So there is moral excellence. There is this knowledge, this practical wisdom from the Word of God. We, we begin to control ourselves we have perseverance, and then we're going to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, for godliness. Godliness reflects the character of God. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and um, verse 7. 1 Timothy 4, verse 7. I'll read it in just a moment. This is Paul writing here to Timothy, uh, the pastoral letter here. And he has been speaking about the apostasy that would come in the last day. And he describes it. Then he switches in verse 6 and says, But you, on the other hand, as a faithful minister, a faithful pastor, this is what you need to do. We'll just read verse 6. In pointing out these things to the brethren, this is, this is just simply pointing out sound doctrine. Uh, the good minister, the good pastor points out sound doctrine. You will be a good servant of Christ, constantly nourished on the words of faith and on the sound doctrine which you have been following. But notice verse 7. But have nothing to do with worldly fables, fit only for old women. So this is those old wives' tales. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of what? Godliness. 
You know this word is used in the pastorals over and over and over and over again. He uses this in the teaching of God's word over and over and over. What is he trying to do? Make sure you understand those two things are vital. Uh, they can't be lost in the mire. The character traits, it's interesting, of the pastor in verse 3 flow into this. Do you know, I've always found this interesting, if you were to look at ver in chapter 3, and we won't do this for time's sake, when it points out the bishop, the pastor, the elder of the church, other than teaching the word of God, all of them are character traits. It's amazing. You, you would think today we were hiring a chief CEO or some sort of grand organizer. And here in the word of God, it says they must be able to teach. No exception. They, they have to teach, which is sort of an oxymoron because it's called a pastor teacher. But it all describes character traits. Why? Because of godliness. There is no godliness when all character traits and virtues and morality is thrown out the window. We must have these and they must be increasing. So we must have moral excellence, knowledge that is practical wisdom, self-control, perseverance, endurance in other words, faithfulness, godliness, and then phileo, you know what that is, Philadelphia. Let's look at two passages because we have to have a brotherly love. What is brotherly love? Let's look at two passages. John 13, of course, the most well-known. John 13, 34 through 35. I, I always find it fascinating because so much of the upper room discourse, discourse are seeds. And the seeds bear fruit in the rest of the epistles. And you'll see this here because this is so much of what Peter later talks. And of course, Peter would have been there. In verses 34 through 35, he says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples. This isn't speaking of the world. He says, And you have, if you have love for one another... The next one we'll look at related to this is in 1 John 4.20. 1 John 4.20. And it speaks of the need for brotherly love. This one is a little bit stronger. It's curious because in a way a lot of times we think of the Apostle John as the Apostle of love. And that would be appropriate. But it's interesting in this one here. 1 John 4.20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, stop for a second. You understand who he's writing to. He's writing to Christians. He's not writing to the lost world. And this is very important. He's not speaking of anyone other than the brethren. This is a writing to the church. If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not. Now that's a stinging verse, isn't it, for us to consider. If we don't have brotherly love for one another, but rather hatred, the question would be posed, have we really experienced forgiveness and the love of God? And the final one in the list of seven virtues is the highest of them, in a sense. It's called agape love. And I, I use these words not to try to impress you or anything like that. I want you to understand is that when we use the word love, we take it and blanketly apply it. It wasn't so in the Greek language. Eros, love, is the love that we have for a wife and a husband, one would hope. <laughs> and then, of course, the brotherly love is the love that I have for you all, the brotherly love. That's an appropriate love. For me to have an Eros love with anyone other than my wife is extremely inappropriate. But agape love is the apex of them all. Agape is the highest of love. You know why? Because it's God's love. It's the one that says, I will lay aside 
what I think is best. I'll lay aside my things. I will put someone else's interest above my own. My grandmother, when she was finally having to go for assisted living, went to stay in this place, and it was called agape. And I always thought of that because that is the Greek word for love, for God's love. And that's what those people were in effect doing. They were setting aside things of their, that would be better perhaps for themselves. They were putting someone else in a better spot. They were showing God's love, if you will. What I want you to see here is that spiritual growth is not automatic. That is, in a sense, one of the things you need to understand. We have salvation by faith in the righteousness of Christ. We have the imputed righteousness or we don't. And it can only be received by faith. But we aren't to be like a doorpost, a, a post out into the ground looking for a fence to be built around it. We are to be more like a tree, like a fruit tree. But it doesn't happen just sitting there. So often we have this idea that, well, I just say the prayer and I just sit there and there's never anything there in Scripture. So I want you to consider this. What are you doing? Are you doing your part? God will hold you accountable for that. Not for salvation. Salvation, there's nothing you can do other than believe. But one day you understand you could sit in the pew for 50 or 60 years and be nothing more than a dead wood post. Imagine what God would say one day. That's it. Loss of reward. Now, you'll notice as we go back to our outline in verses 8 through 9, there is the need to grow. In modern Christianity, we simply have abandoned Scripture in this area. And what we do is we say... The business world and the world around us always focuses on numerical growth, and thus it must be so in the church. The problem is, is that David, when he began to count heads instead of souls that were gods, there was a wrath of judgment that came upon them. You'll find nowhere in the New Testament that speaks of this type of thing. What it speaks of is spiritual growth. We are to grow. And as we grow, we naturally begin to do what? We bear fruit. We abide in Christ and we bear fruit. Peter here goes on this and says in verses 8 through 9, For if these qualities are yours and are, uh uh-oh, increasing. He's not asking you, do you necessarily have them? You would have to have all of them. But he says, are they growing? There's a school of thought. That's probably true. The believer is either moving forward or moving backward. There's no such thing as a standstill. And I would probably say that's probably true. That there's no standstill, really. And the point is, and there might be some individual outliers, but as a believer, you're either moving backwards or you're moving forward. What was the theme verse that I came up with the title of Second Peter? 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace of the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when we do that, notice what he says. You don't have a useless and unfruitful life. Wouldn't the opposite be true? I'm a post, and I've been sitting there for a really long time, and I'm basically useless and have borne no fruit for the Lord. And I say that because that would be a tragedy when you consider what all God has done for us, and He's given us everything, and He simply says, apply diligence, follow my word, follow what I teach, and you will bear much fruit, because apart from me, you'll never do anything, ever. That's what John 15 speaks of. I want to read this to you. Some of the most effective Christians I have ever known are people without any dramatic talents, special abilities, or even exciting personalities. Yet, God has used them in marvelous ways. Why? Well, it's pretty simple. Because they are becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. We wouldn't think that, would we? We would typically say that the person must have dramatic talents and special abilities and an exciting personality. But the true growth is what? The true virtue, the 
true fruit is that those are becoming more like Christ. That's who God really uses. God uses the people for his glory who have become more like him. And so that begs the question, am I like that? Or am I what? Notice verse 9. For he who lacks these qualities is blind and short-sighting, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. This is the carnal believer. The carnal believer has forgotten the grace of God. And so they're more like what they were when they placed their faith in Christ than what they should be, a fruit-bearing tree. I I mention it because there is a bit of sobriety to it. Think of how sad this would be to think that God has given you everything. His Son has died and been crucified for your sins, something you will never be able to do. You never could do anything. He's done it all. He's given you everything to thus, therefore, live for Christ. He's given you His power and His Word. And all He simply asks you to do is, in a sense, cultivate what I've already given you. And you'll bear fruit. But instead, you sit, you sour, you're a post. And you're really no different than when you were converted. Imagine missing out on that. Imagine that you miss out on what all God has done for you. Uh, The redemption that we have in Christ. The purification that we have in Christ. What a sad, tragic thought. So let me ask you the question. If a tree bears fruit and a post decays, which one would you think best describes your spiritual life? Are you bearing fruit or just simply decaying in a post? That's what Peter is saying there. I want to mention three points and then we'll conclude on the screen. The first one is we have a part to play in our spiritual growth, in our spiritual life. The question is, are you doing yours? It behooves us to hear the Word of God week in and week out. Imagine sitting, hearing me preach and teach week after week after week, three times a week, and just haven't been changed. Two, all of these virtues, are they all in my life and growing? Peter doesn't give the option. He doesn't say, well, I showed brotherly kindness when I was 12 years old, the week after I prayed the sinner's prayer, so I guess I'm living up the good old life. No, no. Far from it. Are all of those seven virtues present isn't the question. The assumption is by faith they would be there. They are either growing or dead. And the final one is, are we growing in Christ? And the way to know that, I think, is that quote. A tree or a decaying post. Because that's the options. Which one would you be? The fruitful tree for Christ? Or the wood post simply decaying? If the Lord has spoken to you today, and maybe you do find yourself as a decaying post, I pray you would respond that the Lord has given you everything. All you have to do is call out to Him and say, Lord, I've been living like a post for ever how long. Make me a fruit-bearing tree for your glory. Father, 